I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. It's been not even 48 hours since one of the worst Game 7s I've ever seen. I think a lot of people that listen to this podcast, listen to Bill's podcast, so you probably already heard me. I don't know that I was great on that pod. Um, it wasn't because I was so upset. It was just, I just didn't really know. There wasn't really a counter for what happened. So why come up with one? Why try to come up with one? So I didn't. So I'm going to make a statement about statements uh, after this. But first, I want to pick both conference finals. We start in the East. Okay, so I think you guys have heard me enough now that you <laughs> you, you, you probably could guess I'm going to pick Boston against Miami. All right? Uh, this is a very odd, wide-open conference finals. Uh, we, I still don't know that we fully comprehend what we had throughout the teens. And that was starting with Miami. I mean, you can even go back to Boston putting together that big three. It just felt different. People were less pissed about it because the players were older. Um, I also think there may have been, not that I always agree, there's this anti-Miami stuff that I used to hear when half the lineup was from Miami uh, on radio. But that might have been a bit anti-Miami when people were so upset. And maybe they were just so anti-LeBron because he was the number one guy, right? Right. So if we go back to the first incarnation of LeBron's big three with Miami, and then what started happening with Golden State and LeBron going back to Cleveland with that group, although Love and Kyrie, you know, it still doesn't feel to the level of Wade and Bosch. And then again, once you have Steph, KD and Clay, that takes you all the way through 2019. And so that became the norm. That became the norm for us as basketball fans of like, okay, well, who do I expect to win? Well, who are their three guys? I mean, even when the Lakers grabbed Anthony Davis, the, the entire conversation was built around, okay, yeah, but who's the third? And then I think what we had to do was look around and saying, well, if the thirds are no lo- the the three guys on each team are somewhat diminished, whether it's Clay not playing for two years, um, LeBron being with only one other guy with Anthony Davis, looking around at Milwaukee going, okay, is Drew Holiday somebody who counts? Because if we look at the most recent championships, I guess we could argue Drew, Middleton, and Giannis last year. Um, maybe it would have been Paul, Booker, and Phoenix, or Paul, Booker, and Aiton, and Phoenix. And even in Toronto in 2019, you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure that one like registers a big three, even if we, you know, after Kawhi and Lowry, Siakam. I mean, you know, then I start feeling like we're just trying to name a third guy on some of these basketball teams. So something that became the norm with how we try to project who was going to win an NBA title for for all those years, like it almost took, I, I still feel like there are times just like, hey, remember now, that's not really what we have. And again, maybe we still have in Milwaukee, if you understand the point, but it's not this overwhelming title like powerhouse trio of players that we were very conditioned to having for like 10 years. So that's why when you look at these four remaining teams, Boston's got their two. Miami's got two is, you know, Lowry at, at this point with his hamstring, if you watched him at all in that Philly series, like that's major, major concern. Uh, Dallas, we're not going to get to three. And Golden State, like in theory, has three guys with Green, Clay, and Steph, but Clay hasn't played that well. All right. So I think the talent disparity between Boston and Miami is significant. And I also feel like when you look at what Boston did against Giannis and Kevin Durant, it should be easier against Jimmy Butler. And Jimmy Butler, by the way, has been insane. If you look at the traditional numbers from where Butler was two years ago when they were in the finals, um, the numbers are up dramatically for Butler. But the, I mean, right now he's 29, 8, and 5. Um, but the advanced stuff is way beyond. The advanced stuff is like a massive jump from when Butler looked like one of the best players in the league two years ago carrying that team to the NBA Finals. Now, my counter to that would still always be they played Atlanta and they played a super messed up Philadelphia. Uh, but Butler still was the engine that made this thing go, and I still obviously really like Bam a lot. But if you look at what Boston did against KD and Giannis, this is holding Giannis to 34-15-7 and seven in a seven-game series. But his shooting percentage was 46 and 23 percent. All right. Um, he was at 58 percent uh, against Chicago and he's 55 percent this season. He was 57 percent last season. So holding Giannis to those traditional numbers doesn't seem like you did anything. But that he was 46 percent and the assist started to dip off a little bit, too, there at the end. Um, that's actually a win for any team defending Giannis. Let's look at Durant. Durant played 55 regular season games this year. He's 52 and 38 percent from the floor in three. Against Boston, he was 26-6-6 six, six, six 
which is down from like 30 points a game in the regular season, but he was at 39% overall and 33%. So Boston has shown, and now that they get Rob Williams back, that they can gear up. Again, it's not like they stopped Giannis, but they made him less efficient, which is the entire goal. Butler's still going to get a ton of points. They need to make him less efficient. And I also think when Bam diced up the interior of Boston two years ago in their conference finals, Boston did not have the size options that they have now. So I'm picking Boston. Dallas is kind of like Western Conference Boston. They were 16 and 18 late in December. They traded bad contracts for bad contracts. And as Bill and I covered this at length on Sunday night, it did not dawn on me that it wasn't about who was coming in. It was that you no longer have to pretend that Porzingis is a number two option on a basketball team. Um, And they've always been really good offensively. I would not argue, even though Dallas had the greatest offensive efficiency number we'd ever seen two years ago, that that's the greatest offense that I've ever seen. It was kind of a rising tides thing that's happened with so many of these offenses. And the fact the league has been a lot easier to score in, not so much the first half of this season, but this is something that's been happening for a while. We've talked about it. Um, when I when I look at Dallas, I go, it's a completely different team now because they actually buy in defensively. They know their assignments. Uh, Luca, by the way, who got torched in those first two games against Phoenix, where you're like, man, this is actually bad. Like, are you? What are you gonna? That changed. It changed entirely. Here's another thing that Dallas did. Dallas attacks Chris Paul worse than Pat Beverly on television, and we'll get to that in a second. Don't worry about it. Um, if you look at second spectrum's rankings of the last 10 years of looking at like how many actions a guy could be put in, how many times his man he's defending is setting the screen so that, you know, you're going to get caught up trying to defend all of this stuff. Um, and usually it just means you're undersized, especially against Luca. Uh, the top five games in the last 10 years of Chris Paul's playoff career, where he was used in pick and roll, five of those games were in this series and it was after games one and two. So it's all the other ones leading from 13 times to 24 times. They did it to him in game seven. They did it to him 24 times in game seven and he was not up for it. And you know what else? No one who's small is up for it against Luca because it doesn't matter. And that's the craziest thing about the Luca injury at the beginning. Cause I was like, I don't know, man, that calf injury looked bad. And even when he came up, came back, he looked a little banged up, but to remind us all, you're like, okay, but Luca doesn't exactly need burst and quickness and quick cutting. He just has so much size. So even Mikael Bridges, who is a really good defensive player, both at the rim, switching, you know, perimeter, like he, after a while, you're just like, yeah, you're just going to go for a ride here, man. There's not much you can do. He's going to, if he decides to put you in the, in the mixer, it's over. And when I think about Golden State's matchups with this, I'm not sure. <sighs> I'm going to say it this way. I know what they're probably going to try to do. But I don't know what what Golden State's going to do to try to counter it because, I mean, it's fairly obvious they're probably going to target some of the smaller wings. Um, Does that mean Draymond gets involved quicker with Luka? Is that a mistake? Because then you're getting him in a switch and then Luka's switched up with somebody else. You know, there's some of this pre-switching stuff that you can try to do um, that some teams are really good at, but it's not always easy to do because you're trying to do something ahead of what the other team is doing. And if they don't do it, then you could be out of position on top of everything else. So uh, we'll see. It feels like a Dallas pick based on all the stuff I just said. And there's also a part of me with Golden State. It's like, okay, I know they're undefeated at home. Now they have home court advantage because they have the best remaining win-loss record. But um, should a team be down like 50-plus to somebody and then still feel like, yeah, that team will win the title? But then, you know, Dallas... Dallas didn't look like they were going to be winning an NBA championship the first couple games of that Phoenix series. So this is new. It's it's uncharted territory. It feels very new for me, something we haven't felt in a long time, where there's not this one remaining team with, with the personnel, the headlining personnel that goes three deep that you're like, oh my gosh, how's anybody going to beat those guys? Because Clay's not Clay right now. And even Steph's shooting numbers haven't been terrific. And Draymond has zero interest even in looking at the rim. Like He doesn't even want to keep teams honest. And that might get really weird against Dallas. So I'm, it's a total coin toss for me. I've sounded like I'm arguing Dallas for the pick. I'll go ahead and take Golden State, but I don't feel great about it at all. 